thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, I'm Dustin Loy. I'm a veterinarian and a microbiologist. Um, I lead uh, the Nebraska Veterinary Diagnostic Center, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of speak with the environmental group. Um, you know, most of my work focuses on the hosts, which are primarily cattle that I work with, uh, and then the pathogens. So I work with a variety of gram-negative pathogens, um, primarily those that cause things like res bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia uh, and bovine pink eye. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about kind of the, the things that we're developing, the, the sort of tools and strategies that we've developed on the diagnostic side to really enhance the ability of the veterinarians and the producers um, to uh, improve the information they get from diagnostics uh, and especially where it relates to antimicrobial stewardship. So how can we get sort of the next generation of tools to really rapidly get some information about um, those antimicrobials, is there uh, potentially resistance present? Can we alter our, uh, our therapy choices uh, based on some of the information we get from our diagnostic testing? <clears throat> so a little bit about us. So um, here in, in Nebraska, we had the Nebraska Veterinary Diagnostic Center. Uh, we're the state uh, veterinary diagnostic laboratory. Uh, we do a a variety of testing. We're full service. We do all animals, all species. Um, we do all sorts of testing. Uh, we're fully accredited by the AAVLD. Um, importantly, we're a USDA known tier one lab, so that gives us the ability to help our um, our partners with foreign animal disease testing and surveillance. Um, so for example, with the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak, we were engaged heavily in that space trying to help our state and federal partners uh, in that response. Um, we also work with the FDA vet on the on the for the pet and animal food side. Uh, and we uh, we did a lot of human SARS-CoV-2 testing during the outbreak. Uh, so we have a, a CLIA uh, lab uh, integrated into our facility. Um, but we have uh, experts, teeth in pathology, virology, bacteriology, um, all the ologies um, that are related to animal health. Um, and uh, so we have a wide variety of expertise in that area. Um, as you would expect, being in Nebraska, uh, a lot of our work revolves around uh, cattle, primarily beef cattle. Um, so beef cattle is, uh, you know, the most important, um, one of the most important animal agriculture species in the state. Uh, we have about 6 million plus cattle um, in Nebraska, you know, with, uh, with a million and a half people. So we're, we're pretty heavily outnumbered. Um, and so we have, we have a large number of cattle that we, we need to take care of. Um, so just the, our state alone, it's about $7 billion to contributions to the uh, state economy. And because of that, our biggest concern is uh, what we call bovine respiratory disease or bovine pneumonia. Uh, the older, some of the older terminologies is things like shipping fever. Um, so this is basically a, a viral or a bacterial infections in the lungs um, that will sort of progress to a bacterial infection that's typically treated with antibiotics. Okay, so this is one of the most frequent uh, use causes for antimicrobial use in cattle is the treatment of bovine respiratory disease. Um, and this can be calves in pasture or cattle in the feedlot. There's a variety of, of ways that this presents, but usually the typical scenario is people will purchase um, purchase weaned calves from, from an auction or from a producer. They'll ship them to their feedlots. Uh, that's a very stressful event. And so uh, within a week or two, those animals get pneumonia or bovine respiratory disease that requires treatment with an antibiotic. And there's a variety of different pathogens that are associated with it. Um, it's frequently called a disease complex um, because it's complicated and there's many different bacteria that are involved or potentially involved. And so as we talk about some of our diagnostic strategies, we kind of have to test for a wide variety of things because um, there's a new numerous ones that can cause that, uh, that infection in cattle. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have with, uh, with diagnostics in bovine respiratory disease is that, um, is that they're what we call opportunistic pathogens. So these are bacteria that are always kind of hanging out uh, in the upper respiratory tract of the cow. So they might be in the nose or the tonsils or the pharynx. Um, and so those can be there all the time. And then it takes some contribution, whether that's immune str uh, a stress on the immune system from transport, uh, it might be environment, so it might be a, a weather event, whether that's um, 
uh, you know, a lot of rain, really dry environment with a lot of dust or temperature extremes. Uh, and then um, where I work is kind of the space around the agent. So what's causing that bacteria to kind of go bad where we have, you know, this normal um, uh a cow with a with a low level of bacterial pathogens in their upper respiratory tract, what makes it kind of uh, replicate, start secreting toxins and invade deeper into the lung to cause pneumonia? So this is kind of where, where we work in this space, trying to determine, uh, you know, is this the bad causative um, uh, agent that's causing the problem, or are we just finding the normal one? Um, and we need to use some special tools sometimes to, to figure that out, what, what is normal and, and what's, uh, what's the disease-causing agent. So one of the tools we use is called real-time PCR. So some of you may, may use this um, in your space to detect a variety of different things, um, but primarily we use it to detect the DNA or the nucleic acid of our pathogen of interest. Um, those we use uh, these uh, PCR primers. So these are short uh, little pieces of DNA, maybe 20, 20 nucleotides long that flank a, a region of interest that is typically specific to that pathogen. So we have a sequence that is only found in Mannheimia or is only found in Pasteurella um, or is only found in one of the viruses we're interested in testing for. Okay, so it will amplify that. Uh, and then um, in combination, we use these uh, these probes that have a fluorescent signal. So as this uh, target is amplified, uh, the enzyme that amplifies the DNA cleaves off that um, that fluorophore from the quencher that keeps it from uh, fluorescing. And then that ha happens, we get uh, increase of fluorescent signal in our test tube. Uh, and we can use these with a variety of different fluorescent markers that have uh, different colors. So we can kind of put all these different pathogens uh, together, test for these different pathogens at once. Uh, we can take our sample from our cow, uh, we'll extract the DNA and RNA, We'll throw it in one of these assays with a bunch of different colors, and then we can quickly find out if those are present. Um, this allows us to find very low amounts of pathogen. Uh, so this is the equivalent of maybe like a grain of sand in a, in a, in a railroad car, right? We can find very small amounts um, uh, in, in, that are present in a, a variety of different samples. Um, so this is one technology that we've used that's kind of uh, begun to either replace or supplement our sort of conventional methods. So when we think about our conventional bacterial diagnostic methods, you know, we have the, you know, the blood auger plate where we've streaked our bacteria. We can see them growing here in colonies. Uh, we kind of isolate those and then we mix them with a variety of, of, uh, of sugars and proteins and see what that bacteria is eating and excreting. Um, and based on that, we can identify and say, yes, this is um, E. coli, this is salmonella, this is pasteurella or manheimia. Um, but as you would expect, this requires a lot of media. We got to have all these different plates and all these different sugars. Um, we got to have high quality samples that are collected. So um, as you can imagine, if you take a nasal swab from a cow, you're not just going to get the things you're interested in. You're going to get whatever that cow is eating or smelling or sniffing that day. Um, and so you have to sort of sort out the, um, that from what we're interested in. It takes a couple days. Um, uh, we have new technology I'll talk about that uses proteomics to help supplement our uh, our ability to identify cultures, um, and it's 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 quantitative. So we can sort of say is it positive or negative, or did it come out here in our last streak line? Do we have a lot of growth or a little bit of growth? But importantly, in well, the topic today was we have that bacteria we can do susceptibility testing on. So we can take that, uh, see if that bacteria will grow in uh, media with different concentrations of different types of antibiotics and use that to help tell the veterinarian what might be uh, the best type of uh, drug to treat that infection with. Okay, uh, so the, the PCR, the molecular detection method that instead of looking for the growth of that bacteria, we're looking for that uh, DNA signal. Um, this has equipment that now uh, most labs are comfortable in using. So. Uh, you know, this was, uh, for example, the go-to test for SARS-CoV-2 was a, was a, a RT-PCR um, that, you know, everyone was using and the techniques most labs are comfortable in doing with it. The main advantage is it's rapid. So we can get results in hours instead of days. We can tell the veterinarian or the producer, you have pathogen X, Y, or Z uh, that with, with, within the same time, the same day we receive the sample. 
it's also quantitative. So we can use that, um, how quickly we are able to detect that fluorescent signal is directly related to the amount of pathogen in the sample. So we can quickly tell, is there a little bit, is there a lot, is there, you know, billions of, of bacteria in the sample, or is there just one or two? And that can help um, let us know if that's maybe a real problem or if we're just detecting that normal level of bacteria. Um, in a sample. Uh, the downside is there's we don't have an isolate to do that antimicrobial susceptibility test. So we've come up with some solutions uh, that, that uh, at least in the bovine respiratory disease space, um, might help sort of overcome some of the disadvantages with that. Um, so here's one of the, the tests we developed. So we developed a, a multiplex PCR that can uh, detect all the major bacterial causes of bovine respiratory disease. Um, uh, the advantage of this is it can detect one colony forming unit. So a single uh, bacteria in a sample or a swab it can detect. Um, now, whether that's important clinically or not, um, it may or may not be, but it, it does perform very well. Uh, where we really find advantages is co-detection. So um, I, I didn't mention this, but a lot of times you not only have one of these pathogens, but you have multiple uh, sometimes two, three, or four of them at once. And you can imagine that your growth on a plate gets quite busy when you have all these growing there. Um, and so the PCR really helps us sort out those co-infections. And again, it's much faster. So we can get results in four hours versus two to three days for a conventional test. Okay, so the downside now is when we think about antimicrobial susceptibility is we don't have an isolate to see uh, how, if it is resistant or susceptible to the drugs we might want to test. Okay, when we think about how we do um, how we do susceptibility testing in the lab, you can see that here, this is uh, an auto inoculator. So we have a suspension of our bacteria uh, in a growth a broth media. Uh, and then this, um, uh, inoculates a plate that has uh, uh, sort of dehydrated antibiotics at different concentrations, okay? What we're looking for is determine what we call an MIC or a minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the lowest level of, um, of, of antibiotic that inhibits growth of that uh, pathogen. So you can see we have sort of a serial dilution of this drug. You can see that at two micrograms per mil, that inhibits growth of the organism. So then we know that that's our MIC value. Um, we then have a lot of information about the different bacteria. If we have an MIC value of, of two, that might mean it's susceptible. But if it's out here at 16, then we might say that, okay, that's resistant and maybe we wanna change our, our drug therapy choices. Okay, so we can use this information to help guide the types and dosage, dosages of drugs that we may want to use. Okay, why this is important with BRD is we have a lot of um, uh, issues with multiple, multiple drug resistance. So this is common in bovine respiratory disease uh, pathogens. So here's some data from Kansas State that shows from 2009 to 2011 that they have quite a few um, numbers of uh, up to five drugs for Mannheimia hemolytica, which causes BRD. Here's some data in our lab about the same time period that shows, you know, we have 10 to 20% decrease in susceptibility to those really critical drugs that we use every day um, in veterinary medicine. So telathromycin, like Draxin, um, enrofloxacin, or Batril, you can see that we're getting some decrease in, in the susceptibility. Uh, some work on genomic sequencing found that these are all put together on what we call ice elements or conjugated elements, which basically means that all these resistance genes are packed together in one piece of DNA that then can be transmitted to all their buddies um, uh, in, in the lung or in the cow. Uh, as they're treated with antibiotics. So we want to make sure we can identify these resistant uh, isolates and let the veterinarians and producers know that this is a, a potentially resistant one that they may want to alter their ther therapy for. So what we did is we, uh, we leveraged that similar real-time PCR technology that I talked about. And instead of detecting genes that were specific to those pathogens, uh, we looked for resistance genes, uh, genes that confer resistance in those bacteria uh, to some of the most common um, uh, uh, drug classes that are used for bacteria. So we looked for uh, tetracycline genes and macrolide resistant genes. Um, 
the genes are are highly conserved. So the resistant Mannheimian, a resistant Histophilus, all tend to have the same genes that are conferring that resistance. Uh, so we're able to use this technology uh, to determine if we are likely to have a resistant pathogen um, mm -hmm. in our lungs. So we we do this both for lungs and nasal swabs. Uh, we showed that culture and sensitivity versus this real-time PCR, uh, that it performed quite well, and that it was 95% uh, percent specific and had a positive predictive value, 92%. So 92 out of 100 times, if we did detect uh, a resistance genes in those samples, um, that they were actually, uh, uh, we could link them to a resistant pathogen that we cultured out of them. Um, so you can see that we had a, a pretty good number, uh, all the drugs, macrolides, uh, toathromycin, tetracyclines, they all had uh, pretty good levels of sensitivity and specificity, all over 80% at our, at our cutoff values. So this is one way that we're able to get um, our producers that information rapidly. Um, we can tell them if we detect these genes at the same time we're testing for the presence of pathogens, then they can know if they might need to alter uh, their, their therapeutic choices uh, within a few hours rather than waiting that two to three days. Um, another technology I'll quickly mention, this is, uh, uh, we use mass, a lot of mass spectrometry. So if you have a sort of a chemistry or, a, a, you know, a, I remember organic chemistry lab, we did a lot of this. Um, as a microbiologist, I never never thought we'd, we'd utilize this much, but now it's sort of our go-to technology um, just because it's so rapid. So instead of having to inoculate all those test tubes and broths and do all the different um, phenotyping to identify bacteria. Uh, this is one way we can put it in a machine. Uh, we basically are able to blast the bacterial cells with a laser. Uh, they then are vaporized into uh, ions, uh, pro proton, um, protein ion ionized proteins that travel through a flight tube uh, in a vacuum. Um, and they still follow the, the laws of, of physics, right? So they go, the bigger molecules go slower than the small ones. Uh, and so we get these fingerprints um, from our bacterial cells, which uh, are unique to each species. So we're able to use those uh, fingerprints. We can match them in real time to our database uh, and identify them quickly. So basically we're taking those uh, bacteria uh, proton protonating them, we're flinging them through a flight tube, they hit a detector and we measure how long it takes. Um, and then that is a way we can really get uh, high, high quality information about identification. We've also used this type of technology to look for antimicrobial resistance. So we found that there's two types of our, our major uh, bacterial pathogen that causes respiratory disease called Mannheimia hemolytica. We know that type 1 uh, tends to not uh, have the antimicrobial resistance. Uh, but we know if we have a type 2 that those ones uh, contain antimicrobial resistance genes. Um, so we can do that Malditoff analysis. We can run it through the instrument uh, instead of having to wait another day to uh, for that um, AST panel to grow, we can take the information directly off the spectrometer. Uh, if it has a, if it has the peak on A, this green peak, we know it's a type two and it could be potentially resistant. If it's a B peak, we know it's type one. And so it's probably not uh, going to have a, a issue with resistance. So this is another way we can rapidly get that information to our clients to let them know if they have a type one or a type two uh, Mannheimia infection in their, in their feedlot. Okay, so in summary, we've able to integrate a lot of this technology into our, our diagnostic workflow for our, our clients. Um, how that works is we get a sample submission for an outbreak of bovine respiratory disease, whether that's in a feedlot or a pasture or wherever that might be. Um, we take those samples and we set a culture. And again, remember that takes a day or two um, for us to, to be able to find the growth on the plates. Uh, but at the same time, those come in, we take those same samples uh, and extract RNA and DNA. Uh, we can then run our, our rapid real-time PCR panels um, and at the same time run the panel for uh, genes that confer resistance to antibiotics. Uh, and then within four to six hours, we're able to get results. They then go on our online portal for electronic review, uh, our e-medical e record system directly to our veterinarians so they can get those uh, as soon as they, basically as soon as they come off the instrument and are reviewed by our, our technical staff. Okay, so we can get that rapidly. Then two to three days, two to three days later, we'll have a full MIC workup uh, if we do get any isolates or whatever isolates we do get, and then we're able to give them a comprehensive analysis of of what types of drugs at what level, um, if is there any resistance or not for the drugs they're interested in. So we kind of have a, um, a, a way to rapidly get that information, so the veterinarians can use drugs that the um, um, 
the bacteria are most likely susceptible to, uh, then we're able to minimize that selection for resistance in that in that pen or that animal. Um, we can do a really um, uh, a sort of a improve our ability for drug selection on those on those animals. Um, we're also able to generate a lot of uh, sort of epidemiology epidemiology type data. So as this information comes off, we can provide sort of um, you know, uh, holistic data that's assembled from a, a this is a, a year. You can see that we're able to see what types of pathogens we see um, at what month of the year, how many positive submissions we had, what percentage of those were positive. Um, you can see that uh, manheimia here in red is pretty consistently high throughout the year. But if we look at things like pasturella or histophilus, you can see that there's definitely a, a seasonal effect where we, you know, we kind of peak in June um, and we, then we have low levels uh, in the winter months, um, kind of depending on, on where those samples are coming from. So we're able to give this information, you know, if a veterinarian may not uh, be able to do diagnostics, but wants to know kind of what we're seeing at different times of the year, we can provide that uh, information to them. Um, and uh, again, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today and uh, all our, our collaborators and, and folks that work in our lab. Uh, we have a fantastic team here at uh, the Nebraska Vet Diagnostic Center and uh, uh, thank them for all their work. Mm -hmm.